Good evening. Um, I want to thank everybody who has joined us today for visiting today's new discoveries lecture series from the School of Earth and Space Exploration on this very special Earth Day. Um, my name is Minnie Wadwa and I'm director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And it will be my great pleasure to uh, provide an introduction to the speakers for tonight. Um, I want to also acknowledge that um, helping us tonight from the School of Earth and Space Exploration will be Kim Baptista, Meg Hufford, Alicia Hyatt, and Kathy Chappelle. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is going to be in a Zoom webinar format. So uh, all of the attendees are going to be muted and uh, you're not going to be able to see each other. But at the same time, if you'd like to ask questions, and I certainly encourage that, please note your questions in the Q&A. And we will try to answer as many as possible. Of course, um, uh, we have uh, a number of our students who are here who are going to be helping us to answer some of those as well as we'll try to answer some of them live. Um, so now we can begin. Uh, by the way, I just want to uh, add also that if you want the best viewing for this uh, um, presentation, please uh, switch to fit window in the upper right corner of your screen. So we can now begin our presentations. And the presentation tonight is entitled Earth Innovation, Collaborative Science and Engineering for Exploring Desert Ecosystems. So desert ecosystems are vital to life on Earth, and yet these systems are really poorly understood even today. So in this Earth Day edition today uh, of the new Discovery Lecture Series, we'll learn about how interdiscipl interdisciplinary research uh, which really is the merging of engineering and science uh, and is a hallmark of, of our school um, and, and, and what we do best. Uh, it's being used, how, how that is being used to explore critical questions about the future of desert ecosystems on our changing earth. Um, and our speakers for that will be Drs. Heather Throop and Janeshwar Das. And Dr. Throop is uh, an associate professor and an ecosystem scientist who studies carbon cycling and climate change in desert ecosystems. And she's jointly appointed in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and the School of Life Sciences. And Dr. Das is an assistant research professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. And his research explores a variety of environmental robotic solutions to enable data collection at agricultural farms, forests, and coral reefs alike at unprecedented spatial and temporal scales. So you're really in for a treat today on this Earth Day. And I, again, welcome everybody here tonight. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Heather Throop and Dr. Dhuneshwar Das. And so um, uh, Heather, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Nini. Um, let me just share my screen here. Uh-oh, sure screen went away, hang on. All right, and we have, JD, did you get access? <laughs> we're, we're trying to do high tech here and share, there we go. Okay, um, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minnie, for that introduction. Um, and uh, JD and I are both uh, really delighted to be here to tell you about some of our collaborative work. Um, we're sorry we can't be together in person in the beautiful Marston Theater, but we're glad that at least we have Zoom and we can uh, join together this way. And uh, a special welcome to uh, some of those outside of Arizona. I know that's one advantage of, of, of uh, Zoom events is that we're able to get a, a wider audience. So thank you so much um, for joining us to, um, to celebrate Earth Day today. So this is a really important day for us to reflect about the world around us um, and about our responsibility for supporting sustainability of our planet. And this iconic blue marble image from NASA tells us so many important stories. And I think we can learn so much about life on Earth from taking this distant viewpoint from space. I was thinking recently about how my thoughts about this image have shifted over the years um, I can imagine myself as an undergraduate student. I was a biology undergrad. And if I had talked to you when I was an undergrad about this image, 
then I would have said that I, I would have pointed out these dark green areas like the equator in Africa and, and, and pointed out that, oh gosh, there was all this concentrated life in those areas, right? There's, there's all this rainfall and so much going on there. And that was so exciting biologically. Um, and, but now, um, after years of working in desert systems, I look at this image and my eyes are immediately drawn um, to the dry areas. And I think uh, how much we don't understand is how much is fascinating about these areas. And the vast majority of ecological research still takes place in much wetter environments on Earth. And so we want to take you to these dry land environments today um, and talk with you about some of the research that we're doing in those systems. So it's a, it's a little bit of an unusual format here for a shared talk. So what we'll do, we'll, I'll, I'll start out giving you a little background on dry lands and some of the work that, some of the ideas that motivate my work. I'll hand it over to JD. He'll talk a little bit about automation science and the background of his work. And then we'll try to meld it together and tell you about some of the collaborative work that we're doing together. So I'm gonna use the term dry lands a lot. And by dry lands, I simply mean uh, areas that have some combination of low precipitation and or very high evaporation. And uh, because of these factors, then water is the most limiting resource for plant growth for much of the year in these systems. And there are four broad categories of dry lands. Um, the driest sites we characterize as being hyper arid. These are like uh, this area in the Namib Desert in Southern Africa, where sometimes it might go several years in between rainfall events. Um, arid systems uh, include our own Sonoran Desert here in the Phoenix area. And this Sonoran Desert that covers uh, much of the southern half of Arizona. We get wetter and move into semi-arid systems. A lot of the Western US, uh, there's big chunks of semi-arid in the Western US. We get wetter still and move into subhumid systems. Um, but even in these subhumid systems, there's still major moisture limitation for much of the year. So I'm curious about how you view dry lands in the context of our world. So we have a, a poll for you. Um, can you take a moment, and this should pop up here somewhere on Zoom now. Um, you should have an opportunity to respond to this poll question about how much of the global land surface area do you think is covered by dry lands? Lots of results coming in. Still coming in rapidly, so we'll, 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 we'll keep it open. A couple more seconds. Okay, it looks like most people have responded. So um, if we can share those results then. Okay, so, um, oh gosh, I think we have a lot of dry land residents here. Um, you guys are, are, are pretty close. So 45%, so 38% so of you got, you got that right. Um, and um, this, is, this is heartening to me. Um, it's actually something that we've struggled a lot. There's been um, typically, um, like a, uh, pretty little emphasis, right? We have little cultural emphasis on, and pretty little uh, scientific emphasis on these dry land systems. All right, let's, uh, can we get that poll to go away now? Maybe I can do that here. All right, okay, there we go. So 45% um, so of dry lands are, are or 45% of the earth's surface is covered by dry lands. Um, and um, sort of unevenly distributed, most of them are around the, these belts at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. Um, and while these systems take up um, nearly half the land area, these have been historically understudied. And um, so as a consequence, our understanding of ecosystem processes lags behind. Um, and this turns out to be a really unfortunate knowledge gap, um, particularly giving, given um, emerging evidence that has been emerging recently that these systems will be particularly vulnerable to future environmental changes. So one key issue in drylands is that they're currently disproportionately affected by land cover change and soil degradation. So when we think about land cover change, for, for many people, um, rainforest deforestation comes 
to mind, right? So this is a, a, a um, large scale change in land cover um, has very negative consequences. Um, but in fact, um, the aerial extent of land cover change in drylands is much larger than that in rainforests. So let me show you an example of what I mean. So, um, so woody encroachment is the transition from uh, it, that's happened in many dryland ecosystems from primarily grass dominated systems like this site uh, that I work at that's south of, of Tucson. And so in 1902, you can see the driving a horse drawn carriage through that site. We fast forward 100 years and we have a site that's dominated by uh, mesquite shrubs and cactus. Um, so imagine trying to drive a horse drawn carriage through that site now. Right? Um, but this change in vegetation that we call woody encroachment um, has occurred in drylands globally um, and is the largest land cover change that's occurred globally in the past 100 years. So another change that's happening in dryland systems is soil degradation. And so this is, um, happens in, in particularly in drylands because there's fairly low plant cover, uh, particularly when we have uh, vegetation change. Um, and uh, that leads to the sites being vulnerable to loss of soils through erosion. Um, here's another example. This one also is near Tucson. This is a photo that I took uh, last week when we went down to look at this site. Um, to the left side of the fence is an area that was uh, formerly in agriculture, but agriculture uh, was stopped at the site somewhere around 50 years ago. And so despite that, and there's, there's been um, some major efforts to revegetate it since then, um, but basically nothing grows there. And that seems to be um, uh, th that a large part of this story is a result of soil erosion. That simply like a lot of the, the topsoil has been lost from that site. Um, and climate change makes these uh, systems even more vulnerable to losses of soils through erosion. So another reason that we think uh, drylands are really important to study is that they're really important for human livelihoods. So um, about 35% of the population across the globe is, uh, lives currently in dryland populations. And um, that percentage of the human population that is in drylands is, is um, growing. And of the human population in drylands, um, about 90% of them are currently in developing nations. And of, of that human population in drylands, then about 50% have largely agriculturally based livelihoods. As a result, then more than half of the livestock production in uh, globally is in dryland systems. And uh, so, so this then, and we, when we put this together, thinking about and that climate change is, is occurring in these systems um, and in, in, on average in dryland systems, projections are for the systems to get drier um, and also to expand in their extent. And so this is kind of a, a, a really um, uh, unfortunate situation when thinking about we have many people living in drylands, particularly in developing nations that are highly reliant on agriculture. Um, and that agriculture is typically not irrigated. So they're really um, relying on whatever uh, rainfall there is. And so when it becomes sparser and less predictable, um, then uh, that's a, a, a um, potential tragedy for human lives. So these are some of the ideas that, um, that motivates my research group, the Dryland Ecosystems Research Team. Um, we're based at ASU, and then we also have um, students working with us at the Namibia University of Science and Technology in uh, Namibia in Southern Africa. And so we ask questions related to how human impacts, things like land management um, and global change, that could be climate change or pollution, how those factors um, influence dryland ecosystem structure. So those are things like changing vegetation, um, uh, through woody encroachment or soil erosion, um, or how they influence dryland ecosystem function. And function would be things like carbon or nutrient or water cycling through the system. And so how do those changes in dryland ecosystem structure and function influence things like future climate or sustaining human life in, in uh, drylands into the future? So as ecosystem ecologists, then um, most, most of, much of our understanding of these systems is based on field work. Right? So we spend a lot of time out in the field um, uh, doing things like we show here, right? Hunker down on the ground, making measurements. 
And this is really important work. Um, it's, it's critical for us to do, but it's also limited, right? So we're often limited in space by what, where we can sample, how much we can sample. Uh, there's inherent human bias in, in sampling. We can't get around that. Um, it takes a lot of time and, and highly skilled personnel to collect field data. Um, and there's also a challenge in that we, we can design a really good, you know, experimental design for a particular study and, you know, collect data for that study, but that may preclude getting novel inferences from the study, right? It might not be optimal data for, for uh, addressing other problems that we didn't think of before we did our project. So, and this, these kinds of, of uh, problems are uh, with field sampling, or these are challenges for uh, ecosystem scientists, regardless of what system they work in. Um, but drylands are, are particularly challenging because another characteristic of drylands is that they tend to have really patchy vegetation. So unlike the forest on the left, where it's pretty uniform, drylands typically have some plants and then some bare space and then some other patches of plants. It's really, really hard to get a representative sample. So these challenges have led us to think about novel ways to try to understand these systems. Um, and that's been even more so over the past year, or a little over a year now, right? Where because of COVID, we've had very little ability to get out into the field and make those measurements. And so I wanna turn the Zoom over now to my collaborator, JD Doss, who will share with us a bit about his side of our collaboration, the background of some of the type that he work, of the work that he does, and then we'll put those together. Thanks, Heather. Let's see, change to the next slide. letting you access it there we go no i think for a second uh, we froze but we'll get to this let's see it seems i cannot switch so maybe what i'll do is uh, can i ask you again heather for the key yep yep yeah we're, we're trying to do this high tech uh share this <laughs> share a file from <laughs> from okay let me let's try it again Okay, Does that work now? That's interesting. It's worked in all our practice sessions. <laughs> I can manually advance. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, automation science, which um, would encompass uh, robotics and AI. So let's see if I can change now. Next slide. So uh, my, my argument is that, uh, and hopefully you will be convinced that by using uh, intelligent robots and probes on the ground, we can augment the capabilities of desert ecosystem science, the drylands ecosystem science. And the way we do this is through, of course, the use of robots and AI. Next slide. And uh, where robots are really effective, uh, I believe, are uh, in, in things that are dull, dirty, dangerous, things that we might not want to do, such as going to the Arctic uh, and, and having to sample in the cold or a volcano. Uh, but also a shout out to uh, Dr. Lindy Elkin Stenton and Dr. Jim Bell on the Psyche mission and the Mars 2020. Psyche will be happening. Uh, in a few years and Mars 2020, of course, you have been looking at the Mars rover on the bottom right, uh, uh, the Perseverance rover sending uh, pictures of ingenuity. Um, our space is cool, but I think Earth is a bit cooler and especially since today is Earth Day, I will uh, probably have this friendly jab that we have, we live here, we have a life that is uh, diverse and dynamic. And I feel that we have only scratched the surface in terms of our understanding. Um, so how do we do this? Next slide. So the thing that we um, would like to uh, leverage are some tools that we have developed over the last few years with some funding from National Science Foundation. And the idea here is to, to, to develop software simulation frameworks that run on the cloud that you can see on the top where a drone is flying with end-to-end -end simulation of the physics, of the camera rendering, of all the sensors. 
and it's visually servoing down with a probe uh, that's uh, that red dot. At the bottom, you see um, a, a university team. In this case, it's Vanderbilt University. So we have this event annually every uh, every year since 2016. So Patrick Musau here, who's a grad student, is describing their experience on day two of this three-day competition where they are testing their robot, which they have simulated with the tools that you see above. So together, uh, simulation frameworks, competitions, where they are challenged to develop autonomous systems, in this case, to uh, detect a, a, a probe uh, or a lost object, such as a drone, and recover it. So by having that uh, little abstraction of, of um, detecting objects and recovering, we can then enable it. And you can imagine measuring soil with probes. Next slide. So uh, uh, just uh, so that was for training our students and even training ourselves. How do we plan a mission? Uh, where should we do it? Um, but really, it's not the kind of thing we'll just do once and we'll be done with it. It's uh, I believe it's a loop. Um, and the, it's a loop because uh, you go out in the environment, as you can see on the uh, right hand side, we deploy our uh, robots, or in other words, cyber physical systems that might also include things like sensor probes, uh, sensor network that you can kind of see what those wireless symbols. Uh, these enable uh, automated collection of large volumes of data. And hence, you can already see that it can augment our capabilities, especially if you have to go underwater and measure or in the vast expanse of dry lands where, uh, if not anything, dehydration can put you in big trouble. Um, so all these data then goes into a modeling phase where we leverage our own tools. So you saw in the previous slide um, a simulation framework, but we also have tool sets to do a lot of analysis. So on the right, we have robots. On the left, we have artificial intelligence and machine learning. That doesn't mean robots do not use artificial intelligence. I'm kind of just drawing the contrast a little bit. And our group does both at ASU. We build robots the, like the ones you may see behind me. There are some drones. Uh, uh, stage there, and uh, but also other kinds of robots. And then uh, they might have to make decisions online. So some of that is using onboard machine learning algorithms. But on the left hand side is where we are doing large volumes of data analysis with uh, domain experts in the loop. And the, then the models that we speak of here could be mechanistic models or 3D maps of a terrain. Um, and, and or it could be sam uh, the, the kind of things that will enable you to, to uh, do experimental design. For example, it could even be a micro model of some sort where you're measuring aspects of the soil and you're predicting what to see. Um, part of our experimental design actually happens in our simulation test bed uh, that you just saw, where we can simulate uh, physics, uh, lighting, rendering, but also insert uh, things like terrains that we have mapped or move the sun to change, see how shadows change, uh, things like that. So once we have done that, we come up with some plan and some policies for what to do next in the field. And this loop should continue as long as you have some information gain. And I'm kind of using that phrase in a sense that at some point there will maybe be diminishing returns in any new sampling that you're doing. But it might still have to go on for a bit for our insights to, to develop. Next slide. So I'll now show you some examples from not so long ago. Uh, I was a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania just before I came to ASU. And uh, I did a lot of work in the context of applying autonomous systems to precision agriculture. And I think precision agriculture or agriculture in general is probably a compelling, compelling um, problem. Um, so it seems I have control now. <laughs> Let's see if it changes later. So what you see here is a drone with a multispectral camera that we built uh, at that time. And uh, very quickly, what it's showing is that as this drone flies through this orchard uh, in California, in this case, it can, uh, it can monitor plant, uh, plant stress. And that you see on the right-hand side in the center, which is uh, the uh, uh, showing, red is showing healthy plant and blue is showing maybe lack of vegetation. And I think I again lost control. Is that a next slide? Um, oops. Going ahead a little bit farther, um, um, so that was kind of above from up in the air, looking down on another and quantifying health. Here you see sideways uh, a more sophisticated sensor suit you can see on the left hand side, where uh, on top of color um, on this video, left top, there's color, visible spectrum. Then in the center, you have near infrared. At the bottom, you have uh, thermal imaging. Um, 
and then on the right hand side you actually see reconstruction of a bunch of dwarf apple trees in uh, as a lidar which is also part of the sensor is moving and then on top of this lidar point cloud you can overlay any of these channels color um, near infrared thermal so in effect you have a multi spectral 3d point cloud and why is it useful? Well, you can then analyze the morphology of the plant. Next slide. Again, going farther out, you can see now moving on from just morphology to a higher order information. So here what's going on on the right hand side is it's showing you detections of oranges in an orange uh, farm, an orchard, where uh, we have used an artificial neural network, in, uh, specifically a deep neural network. Uh, this is not so uh, like this. This some this has happened in the last five years or so. It has uh, this technology has really moved. So the kind of things we could do in the agricultural farm was detect the fruit, but then you are not done. You have to track the fruit. So use some computer vision robotics methods, and then if you can do that, then then the robot uh, then you can get a count that you can see at the bottom. Next slide. And this is my favorite. What you're going to see here is what we call, a, uh, call an aerial phytobiopsy drone. So in the previous examples, we of course improved the quality of our information, but we were sensing remotely. And there will always be scenarios where you need to bring a sample back. And one such scenario is plant disease. Like if you have a new disease to analyze, you have to bring it back to the lab and understand it. And then maybe you can develop some sensors that will enable you to predict the disease um, uh, using remote sensing. But in the meantime, in the interim, you have to bring back samples. So a bunch of undergrads supervised with me uh, build this drone that helps you collect leaf samples. And uh, this is useful because uh, you can also think of other abstractions. As you're watching this video, I hope you are able to uh, kind of envision other use cases of such technology. So this drone is trying to chew a leaf. Um, this time it did a great job. Uh, you could imagine getting back multiple leaves. And here is an example where the robot is struggling a little bit. Maybe the branch was a little thick. And let's see what happens. It seems this round, the tree won. Um, so these are some great examples of how robots can help us. And um, uh, the team that we have at ASU, so I started here in summer of 2018, uh, is interdisciplinary. So next slide, Heather, sorry. And we have po uh, postdocs and students, uh, interdisciplinary engineering sciences, um, uh, together, we are called the Distributed Robotic Exploration and Mapping Systems Laboratory, and we are also part of the ASU Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science, uh, led by Dr. Greg Asner. And, um, and then I am very excited to be part of this group because of the kind of things that Heather will talk about next. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, JD. So now we'll give you a little bit of an idea of some of the collaborative projects that we're doing. Um, and these are very much works in progress. These are uh, current um, projects that students and postdocs are doing that are working in our overlapping research groups. So I hope that those of you who are here in the Sonoran Desert are able to get out frequently to explore our beautiful surroundings. Um, and I hope that you, you, you know, take in the beautiful vistas, but that you also take time to look down uh, at the ground. So these are some photos from a recent trip to Oregon Pipe National Monument. And uh, I was looking at the vistas and then I stopped and I looked down and uh, the, the rock there that I've circled in pink um, is a quartz rock. So I, I stopped and I picked it up and I was really excited to see that the, uh, the underside was uh, covered in what I very technically call green goo. So this is cyanobacteria. So these, these are microscopic organisms and they photosynthesize like plants. They're not plants, but they have that same capability to take in carbon dioxide and use sunlight and, and um, uh, into metabolize, the, metabolize those, those compounds. And so it's really amazing. They live under the, the rock, as we call it, hypolith is under the rock. Um, there's enough sunlight in our, you know, really bright desert sun um, that that sunlight actually makes its way, you know, transmits is transmitted through the quartz rock, um, and there's enough that makes it through that it powers photosynthesis. And as an added bonus, the rock also mediates the harsh temperature and moisture conditions of the desert, and so it provides a sheltered environment. This is just like super cool. So um, I, I hope that you'll stop and you know 
pick up some coarse rocks, put them back. They're, they're usually pretty small, like the one that you see here. Um, but you might get lucky occasionally, something like, like this rock that my student Elise Nalipo found in the Namib Desert. Um, we call this the Sasquatch of a hypolith, right? It's enormous. Um, so I think of hypoliths here in the Sonoran Desert as, as kind of a cool oddity, right? It's just this crazy thing that, that organisms exist with this lifestyle. Um, but there's a lot of plants around. Um, if, if we think about large scale processes in the system, something like carbon cycling, whatever the hypoliths are doing is, is probably not that important. But the story is maybe different if there aren't as many plants around. So if we go to the hyper arid Namib desert, and then um, as you can see here from this photo, there's not many plants around. Um, and, uh, but as you can see here also, in some areas, there are a lot of quartz rocks. So this is a project that was um, done by uh, Brittany Monis, who was a, uh, at the time, a undergraduate honors uh, thesis student here in School of Earth and Space Exploration. And she worked in collaboration with two of my Namibian students, Elise Nalipo and Bambai Marufu. And uh, so the three of them worked together to explore how hypoliths affect the amount of carbon in soils in the Namib. And um, so, so they measured the amount of carbon that was in the soils under hypoliths. They picked up the soils and sampled the, or picked up the rocks, sampled the soils underneath. Also compared that with rocks that were, that were dark, that didn't transmit light through, and uh, also soils that didn't have rock covering on them. And as you can see from this graph, then there was a lot more carbon under the hypoliths than in bare soils or in the, the rocks that didn't transmit light. And so this made us wonder, this is pretty cool, I and mean, that's what's happening at the, the scale of individual rocks, but that made us wonder what's the potential for hypoliths to affect soil carbon storage across the landscape? You know, is this actually, is there a substantial amount of carbon in the soils as a result of these quartz rocks? Um, so this begs the question then, how do we scale up from these individual rock measurements to incorporate the distribution of rocks or how many rocks there are and what the size is of these rocks? Because that, that, that seems to matter to the story as well. And, and how can we kind of put those together to make some guesses about how soil carbon is uh, affected by hypoliths? So I scratched my head a little bit about this and then I posed this problem to JD. Thanks, Heather. Let's see if I can change. Ah, there we go. So now I have control. So on that note, so let's go from fruits to rocks. So when Heather mentioned this problem, I think we were lucky because we were already working with Dr. Ramon Aerosmith at, at uh, CC on mapping these granite rocks at, at volcanic tablelands, Bishop, California, not too far from where we are in Tempe. Um, so here we flew a drone with a multispectral camera that you can see on the left. Uh, then we apply something called structure from motion, which is uh, a C um, umbrella uh, term for algorithms that uh, derive structure from, from the motion of a camera, for instance. Um, then we get these high resolution authorectified images in this case. And uh, the main point uh, here is that we then annotate some of these images. A human expert will say, this is a rock. And we use our online web tools that we have developed for that called deep GIS. And then we uh, leverage neural networks. So these modern neural networks can use uh, some certain number of annotated images, let's say a few hundred rocks, and then uh, it can train a model. You can train a model like the, one of the machines behind me at the corner. Uh, and then you get a semantic map or a map with meaning. So in this case, you have 80,000 rocks being shown in this red outline, where each outline is actually a polygon that it's kind of zoomed out. And you can even see the roads and other structure. and that dark band is actually where there is a change in topology. Uh, the, then going from left to center to right on the top workflow uh, diagram, and again, this was all done by Ziang, I get to talk about it. Uh, Ziang is my PhD student. And uh, at, the, 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 at the end of all this, we do geomorphological analysis. And for the quartz-like rocks, in the case of hypolith, what we really want is a size distribution or area distribution. And we had already started doing this in the context of rocks. So let's see what it means for hyperlith. And it seems I lost it again. Sorry, Heather. <laughs> I'll keep bothering you. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so here uh, we have data on the left from, uh, from the Namib Desert that Heather uh, has collected with her students and, and slightly different lighting, different locations. So we took uh, tiles from these very high resolution images where the measuring tape is giving scales. And then Kat, Heather's undergrad uh, honors thesis student, uh, carefully annotated a sample set of rocks, uh, set it aside. Then she annotated another set of rocks to train a neural network and then we, she went back to the rocks that she had annotated herself and then ran the neural network. So what you see on the right hand side are um, the, the two columns. Uh, the first column is the human, the second column is AI. And on top you see histograms and just I'll point out that the, the uh, y axis, uh, let's see. So y axis is frequency, the x axis is area. And, and what we are trying to do now is compare these distributions and see how well we are doing. And of course, there are various tools to do that. This is very new. Kat just finished her honors thesis and we are already beginning to see uh, the comparisons of these two. Now, if you're wondering what these colors are, they are just showing distinct quasi-like rocks under which there might be hyperlates. So quite an exciting start going from fruits to granite rocks to quasi-like rocks. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, JD. So our second research story that we wanted to share is about organic litter. So there's vast amounts of carbon dioxide that are taken up by uh, the, in, from the atmosphere through plants via the process of photosynthesis. And about half of the carbon that's fixed by photosynthesis each year ends up as uh, plant litter. And this is just, this is dead material. This is things like uh, plant leaves that fall to the forest floor. And the fate of this plant litter is really important for carbon cycling um, and then ultimately climate change because the, the rate at which that material decomposes controls the rate at which carbon dioxide is returned to the atmosphere. So that basically that uh, plant litter could end up in, incorporated into the soil where it could be stored for a long time or it could be um, released very quickly but back up into the atmosphere. And so in forests, we have a very good understanding of the dynamics and controls over litter decomposition. Litter falls to the forest floor, decays in a pretty predictable manner. Um, it's, it's usually a pretty even layer across the soil surface. Um, but it turns out that the questions are a lot harder in dryland systems. Um, our models and our measurements simply don't reconcile with each other. Um, and my research group has shown that one really important difference is that litter just doesn't make a nice even layer of, uh, on, on the surface of dryland soils. Um, so there's this problem with there's low plant canopy cover and that leads to very uneven inputs, right? So we have some places where there's a lot more litter that accumulates than others. And that's compounded then by wind and water that move things around because there's not much plant canopy cover to, to limit the extent of wind and water moving things. Um, and so then we end up with these patterns where litter accumulates really unevenly on the ground. So we have litter that ends up like here next to shrubs. It might be under rocks uh, in foraging pits made by animals. Um, or even as here in a, a depression um, that was made by an ostrich running across the surface of the sand here. And so litter decomposes at really different rates in these different places. Um, and that's in part because the moisture and temperature conditions are very different in these different locations. So it's then, it's, it's really critical for our, our improved understanding of dryland litter decay to understand you know, what's the distribution of this litter, where on the landscape does litter accumulate, and what are the dynamics of litter movement? So this is another question that it would be really hard for us to address with our traditional field sampling methods. Um, and so it's another question that I posed to JD a few years ago. Thanks, Heather. Let's see, uh, maybe the... Yeah, let's, uh, I'll again have to <laughs> bother you, Heather, Got sorry. <laughs> So a very exciting problem, like how do we map litter? So let's start with how we might even find litter. So it's useful to ask, how should we map vegetation? So in this case, again, the same drone that we tested in Bishop, California has a multispectral camera. The site has rocks and uh, vegetation, good topology. In fact, a pretty interesting site to even ask us so how litter might move. So in this, however, what you're seeing is that we can use the red band and near infrared band and determine uh, 
kind of vegetation mapping using some vegetation indices. And in this case, the green is showing the presence of healthy vegetation. So now at least we can uh, map, uh, we can know where to go down and then look for litter. So what do we mean? So again, the idea will be, we went from fruits to rocks. Now imagine instead of the rocks, we are thinking uh, leaf litter or twigs, things that can be annotated and has been identified as litter. Next slide. Oh, okay. So that um, so let's first let's look at two dimensional litter mapping. So in the case of rocks, also we saw looking top down using orthorectified images, some annotations, and then those detections. Um, I did some experiment in my backyard, in fact, uh, where you see those leaves. I took about 160 photos, in fact, with just my iPhone. But then these days, computers have become so powerful, and in fact, the cameras are also so good on these phones that you can actually build a 3D model. Uh, by, uh, and then once you have done that, you also get an orthorectified image that you see at the bottom. And then um, on panel C, in fact, you're also seeing the, the human, uh, well, me, hand annotated litter mask, and then uh, what the AI predicted. And then we compare in this case, how mass and area relate. Um, very quick preliminary study, but very promising. We saw that, well, we are not too off. Now, if we go to 3D, here um, we have our, our head of postdoc, Dr. Alex Hueva. He uh, did a more controlled experiment going from just the, what I had done in my backyard to taking some measured amount of litter, putting some fiducial markers, the checkerboard. So cameras, when we use that gives us scale and also gives us uh, in some instances, a coordinate frame to work with. And so you see a 3D model of the litter and on the right, it's a, a graph like uh, recent results, literally from last week, where you see that we are beginning to see a good relationship between, between a volume and weight, which will be useful to determine how much of litter biomass might be there somewhere, uh, can be somewhere. Um, all that is good, what next? How do we determine litter transport? So here I have this kind of a, a, a slightly funny video, I would say, so where I uh, thought, well, let's try an experiment, start with tumbleweed. Now, of course, those spheres are my idealized tumbleweed, but I have set the mass maybe wrong, or like, you know, these are representative, but hopefully you can begin to see so this is our simulation environment. This terrain is in fact that terrain that we mapped with a drone. And now we can put these goofy little tumbleweed proxies and see how they transport. But then uh, we have serious work ahead, which is all the litter that Alex is mapping. Uh, we have to isolate those from the ground and then put it in the physics engine, play with wind and gravity and see, can we, can we see litter transport? Back to you, Heather. Thanks, JD. So for our next vignette, I want to start by, again, taking you out for a walk in the desert. One of the things that I really like about working in drylands is just looking out and seeing these long vistas, right? And we can wander off and explore in any direction. You can imagine you could walk out to those mountains. Uh, there wouldn't be any tangle of rainforest vines to get in your way, and you could just easily walk around any, uh, any tree. But this view, this, this surface view of, of uh, lack of complexity um, is actually missing out on a lot of the really important biology in these systems. So it turns out in these systems, um, in drylands and the forest is really beneath our feet. So there's typically much, much more biomass, much more plant material life um, below ground than above ground. So we're getting this false view that there's not that much going on. And we have very little information about below ground root structures. They're really hard to access, right? We can't see them. Um, but we do know that there's a lot of variation among species. So this is um, one of the few studies that we have that really mapped out root structures and showed these are all different species and really different structures um, below ground. And we know that these different structures can have a really big influence on, on things like the movement and storage of water and carbon and nutrients, and so really big influence on the systems. So it's a really critical question, you know, how does root structure differ among species and what are the consequences for ecosystems? So this is another problem that my group posed to JD. How do we possibly measure these structures? Thanks, Heather. Yeah, this, this question is hard because, well, we can't see roots and you have to take them out. Uh, luckily, we had already started looking at litter. We knew that we can use photogrammetry or, or, for instance, moving a good camera around, taking all the images, doing what we would call batch optimization or offline, looking at all the data and extracting 3D structure. 
So I thought was let's let's try with try that. So let's see how the results look. Um, Heather, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, so here you see Heather's graduate student Edauri, who um, first tried some experiments uh, out on on this line where she has clipped a root that she has carefully cleaned. And then uh, uh, hundreds of images, a few images were taken. In some cases, you will need hundreds if the root structure is quite dense. In this case, a few images, then structure from motion. Again, the same idea. We have this, uh, these, these what we call fiducial markers, those white tags that give some amount of information on scale. Uh, our software algorithms will know how to use these. And then what you get are these three, uh, uh, three views of this 3D model. Once you get that, you can uh, apply the same techniques as Dr. Cueva, uh, 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 Heather's postdoc, uh, whose work you saw earlier, and you could perhaps estimate volume. This is again fine if your roots are uh, visible like this, but oftentimes the roots can be quite thin. So what do we do for those? So let's take a look. So in this case, you see um, uh, Edauri uh, doing this test where we see the plant above, but if you dunk your camera underwater, you begin to see the roots in its full um, like spread out the details um, in high resolution, the kind of things you can't see if the same root is just hung in hair, uh, air because everything will be clumped together. So in fact, the water could be used first to wash off the root, but then uh, in still water, if you put your roots, you can map them. So in fact, right now, our next step is to get a 3D model. Uh, it's easier if we use multiple cameras going in together. Um, but we are already beginning to see some details of these, of these uh, root system. Another example in this next video, let's take a look. Uh, uh, it's a little shaky, so I'll maybe pause at some point, even just by looking at the video. The main innovation here is that we uh, already took the root, put it underwater, and in fact, we have been doing some underwater mapping, so we are trying to, there's a synergy between all these different projects, and in this case, uh, I think we are some exciting times ahead. We'll begin to see some 3D maps. Our algorithms need to be slightly better than the case where we are mapping things out in air. But the way to see the detail really is in the water, we believe. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, JD. So for our last vignette, I want you to start out by imagining yourself in the harsh sun of the Namib Desert. Um, so there's no trees for miles. Um, and so you can imagine even this dead tree begins to look like an oasis. Um, although JD has pointed out that like this guy has picked the wrong side of the tree to, <laughs> to sit on, he's not even getting any shade. But if we, if we move to the wetter Sonora Desert here in the Phoenix area, um, we still rely a lot on shade, right? So um, shade is really important for making our lives more pleasant. And one of the most important decisions that homeowners uh, make about their houses is the kind of cooling that they might get from a tree. Um, but there's a lot of complexities in selecting shade trees and, and often the planting decisions are made without uh, a lot of planning. And so if you take a look at these, these trees here, I'm uh, just curious, what would you first thought about, what would you be most inclined to, to put in your backyard to provide some relief from the Sonoran desert heat? If you're familiar with our Sonoran Desert plants, uh, see A is a mesquite, B is um, Arizona sycamore, C is a pine, D is actually one of my favorite pieces of Tempe art. It's a metal sculpture near Tempe Town Lake that, that does provide some nice shade. So these trees have really different aesthetics, right? They have, but they also have different water use and shade quality. So um, there's a lot of factors that go into the decisions about, you know, what somebody might want to put in their backyard. All right, let's stop the poll there. It's like lots of people have voted. Okay. Oh, wow. We have a clear winner there. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have a clear winner here for um, mesquite. That's nice. That's one of our native uh, uh, plants or there's uh, native uh, varieties of it, native species. So. Um, that's great. Oh, not many people went for the dead or the, the, the tree sculpture. Uh, oh, let's see. Could you share those results, Alicia? I'm not sure that everybody can see them right now. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so, um, so and, and the point here is there's not really a right answer, right? And, and this is something that, that we do often just make kind of really quick decisions about. Um, 
you know, but but this is some, but there's a lot of factors that should go into what is the best tree uh, for the circumstances. And so Dr. Luisa Aparcido, who's a CC Exploration Postdoc Fellow, and she's working with JD and me um, to explore how we might optimize recommendations for urban trees. And Luisa has a really fantastic team of students who are working with her on this problem. So there's complex factors that determine what is the best tree for an urban environment. So shade from our intense desert uh, sun is an obvious one. Evaporative cooling is another really important factor, but it's that, that one's much more difficult for us to visualize and assess. Water use is also really important. Um, and, and that's especially important for homeowners that are needing to budget for water bills and maybe install and maintain an irrigation system. And, uh, but often they're just, you know, don't have that information when they make that, that uh, decision of what tree to plant. So Louise is really interested in this, this uh, how we can explore this multifaceted problem um, of um, how to address the question of you know, how do tree species differ in cooling relative to water use in urban drylands. So I'll hand it over to JD to discuss how we've approached this problem. Thanks, Heather. So let's see what we have to offer to solve this problem. Now, the complexity here is that, so we started with, uh, we, we, we looked at so far litter roots. Well, initially it was quartz rock. Then we kind of looked at 2D litter, 3D litter, three-dimensional roots, complexity increase. Now we are talking about the, the living tree, the dynamics of the tree. So it's regulating its conditions, but in doing so, it's also helping us uh, we want to see how much hum uh, comfort it can provide, thermal comfort. So here, uh, Dr. Uh, Aparsido Luisa has uh, this test site at Desert Botanical Garden that you see where we uh, uh, leverage these sensor suits, the one that you're seeing uh, where I'm pointing my finger behind me uh, with variety of sensors. And uh, there are 60 plants, um, uh, 15 species, four replicates uh, each, so a very diverse collection. I think it, it might be one of those unique collections here in Tempe at this time where then for this set of plants, uh, various studies are carried out. So on the bottom left, you see thermal images of shade. Of course, shade you can see with your eyes, but the thermal characteristics can be slightly different. So it's worth uh, measuring that. Uh, on the center, bottom center, you see a probe, a sensor port, the probe that we have designed with onboard compute. We call it EarthPod, uh, quite appropriate for to this team. Uh, it can measure uh, so, uh, moisture, sorry, humidity, temperature, and light. And in some other versions, it can also measure soil moisture. In this case, we are not. So it's measuring near the canopy, what are the conditions? Uh, some of those we keep on soil and it measures the same three properties, time series, dense time series. And at uh, bottom right, you see Louisa's student, Shanika, uh, who's taking uh, gas exchange measurements uh, uh, we, you, and water vapor measurements uh, with a porometer. Now, so the kind of data we can see with these, so now let's look at some of the results. And this is late breaking. This is literally from yesterday. And on the left, you see, um, uh, on the left, you see a bunch of images that have been acquired with just a GoPro, in fact, in this case. Uh, so let me see if I can play the top video. There we go. Heather, could you just, uh, thank you. So that video is showing um, so the algorithms are again so powerful these days that you can take a series of images and that blue is showing uh, how the camera, the, how the camera moved, you can see how it was oriented. And we already have a 3D model. It's, it's not yet very good, but the reason is that like it, it can take an hour or so to build a model. So if you invest a little more time, it'll get sharper. And of course, at some point you have to decide, well, I need a better camera or other cameras. So to go from that, the, the video that you just saw where we are using this GoPro, uh, data, but at the bottom you see uh, our next generation sensor, uh, like where let's say um, your your you can get an initial model, but then you can leverage this lidar-based multispectral image. So you get some initial model, then you bring back your big sensors. So this is actually my backyard where my graduate student Rakshet did this experiment, where the arrows, the red arrows, are showing how the camera is oriented. In fact, you can see this little round image at the bottom. It's a fish islands, actually a stereo camera with an inertial measurement unit. We get the pose. And then what we need to do is just, uh, uh, we're just assembling the point cloud. So we are getting a 3D uh, point cloud as that LiDAR is moving. The benefit of LiDAR is active sensing. Um, 
these are now commonplace with our, uh, self-driving cars, but we are using it for science here and, and it's actually very exciting. And you can already begin to see those tree canopies. And this is without any post processing, it's just the raw LiDAR data being assembled using the pose of this sensor suit, which also has various other cameras. It has a global shutter camera that can take various frames per second. But what do we do with these tree models? How do we get to um, uh, modeling shape in this case? So we looked at how to measure thermal properties, what the leaf is doing. So that will bring me to the final piece of our story in our collaborative efforts, which is modeling shade with simulation. And here you see uh, that same site that we were at at Bishop, California. In fact, we had an easy up that you see in the center. We had our vehicle. I thought wouldn't it be nice if I could put a tree and see how that shade would have been. So you're beginning to see the kind of models we are building. We can put it, uh, uh, all those uh, uh, 3D models, move the sun. And of course here I was moving the sun, but we can program all this. We can move it exactly how we expect it to move and do this analysis and simulation. And then the data from the ground that we see then helps us tie it all together. Back to you, Heather. Thanks, JD. So we hope that these vignettes have given you a flavor of the kinds of questions that we are asking, or really our research groups are asking, and, and how we're exploring patterns in two dimensions and three dimensions uh, below ground and with these complex patterns of, of uh, dynamics through time. So I'm really excited with the possibilities that these new tools provide us for and an enhance our science. And this is this is facilitated by this fantastic interdisciplinary and collaborative environment that's fostered by the School of Earth and Space Exploration. So we're really quickly seeing that these tools like revolutionize our ability to understand drylands. Um, and we certainly won't stop uh, spending time in the field. We'll still be down on our hands and knees and taking samples, measuring things. But these tools can really help augment our field-based science and enhance our capabilities and our understanding of these systems. So I'm also thrilled that the timing has made it possible uh, for us to maintain some forward momentum on science despite the pandemic. Um, so for example, we have a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation um, to engage US and Namibian students in collaborative research projects in the Namib Desert. The first program was supposed to be scheduled for last year. Uh, sadly, that was canceled due to the pandemic, and uh, we were hopeful for this summer, but it became clear that, that travel uh, this year would be similarly impossible, and, and um, this really weighed upon us, right? This loss of student training opportunities um, uh, was just such a disappointment, but with some creativity, um, and then uh, the collaboration with JD's uh, group and the use of automation science tools, um, we've now come to the realization that we still can engage US and Namibian students to work together creatively um, and collectively in a virtual environment. Um, so science and student training will move forward this summer um, despite the pandemic. So thanks so much for spending this Earth Day evening with us. We're really um, excited about this collaboration and the fantastic our, our fantastic research groups here at ASU. Um, and JD and I are both delighted to be able to work with such fantastic researchers here at ASU and then to have the opportunity to share this research with you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Troop and Dr. Das. Um, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and take some Q and A's uh, or some questions that we have. And the first one is um, from Howard Lannis who wants to know, would it be easier to do precision agriculture via vertical farming or is that later in the future? So great question, hopefully one of you can cover. Yeah, I can, I can give my brief comment on that. I mean, uh, from what I understand, if you're doing vertical farming, you still need to burn energy to keep the lights on. Um, I don't know, like, you know, so it would be, uh, there's a lot of uh, thought there. Uh, but from a point of view of your automation, so what is better? Is the sun better or like, you know, should you use LED, like, you know, uh, lights? That aside, um, I don't know when growers will move or when. Um, in terms of automation, if you have vertical farming, you, the choices you have will be to augment your vertical farm uh, with sensors or you'll need small drones with sensors. So it's a question of, again, how you would monitoring. So I suppose I'll say, 
I don't know about energy efficiency, <laughs> but I can say that from point of view of automation, um, uh, it has slightly different uh, challenges. You'll need probably onboard illumination. You won't have any sunlight that's helping you, for instance, to say take NBVI unless there are some arrangements. I'll pause there. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. All right, and we have another question um, from Amy Knudsen for the detection of quartz in the desert. IR remote sensing would be a powerful tool. Has anyone been using IR wavelengths in these identification processes? Um, Heather, like, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I have my comments I can make later. I yeah, I'll, I'll let you take that one, JD. Yeah, so the, the Bishop data that you saw um, uh, where we are detecting the rocks, actually we used a multispectral camera and there were two near infrared bands and it did help at least in detecting the uh, granite rocks. Now, quartz, I would imagine that if we had the multispectral camera like the one, have, uh, uh, so I have to check out. Uh, so you, it seems that you're saying in near infrared, it might help. I do know that uh, crystalline structures, at least from CC faculty, something like X-ray fluorescence, those things, uh, I'll be happy to discuss. I am willing to learn more. Yeah, I mean, we, we deploy multispectral cameras. We have spectrometers. It's a question of the, the uh, 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 training a neural network or some model that can uh, work well with multispectral data. And already we have been using uh, uh, five bands at least in detecting rocks. So yeah, if we know which wavelengths might help, uh, we could absolutely try that. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Wonderful. And our last question of the evening is, could you discuss the ongoing drought situation in the southwestern US, the decrease in aquifers and population growth? Thank you for the wonderful presentation. That, uh, oof, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, huge question. <laughs> um, and a really important one. I, I guess I would what I can say briefly is that we are in a severe drought in the Southwest. Um, I was just looking earlier this week. Uh, there's a, if, if you can just do a Google search and there's a, um, a drought index um, and that, that um, categorizes our drought situation and um, there's uh, sort of like D4 is the highest drought category. And I think something like 30% of Arizona was in D4 and um, maybe 80% was in at least D3, was either D3 or D4. So um, yeah, so we're in, it, it doesn't get worse than D4. Um, so uh, and yeah, we're in a really severe drought situation. Um, the aquifers uh, are also, or some, some of our reservoirs are very low. Um, that sort of you know complex um, factors that go into each of the each of the reservoirs, um, and there's some really great resources. I really encourage you. There's a um, Southwest Climate podcast, which is really fantastic, um, um, and um, a, a Climas C L C L I M A S I think is a, a, a climate hub um, that. Um, provide some really great syntheses of, of um, Southwest specific data. I really encourage you to, to look that up because uh, that will provide you much more um, information and, and uh, continually up to date information. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really severe situation and, and really important to think about as we you know, celebrate Earth Day today and think about the sustainability of, um, of where we're living, right? And that we are, uh, yeah, you know, one, um, you know, drylands are sort of by nature um, pretty, uh, typ or typically quite unpredictable uh, rainfall, but we are also in uh, a situation that is, um, there's really clear climate change signal um, influencing this uh, long-term drop that we're in. Thanks. Okay, um, well, I think, um, that's all of our questions. And thank you to Heather and JD for sharing all your knowledge and insights about engineering and ecosystem science. And thank you again for being part of our Earth Day celebration and being our presenters um, for the New Discoveries Lecture Series. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone who attended tonight's lecture. And we hope that you'll join us in the fall when we resume our New Discoveries Lecture Series. 
and showcase our current research from the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And so with that, I will say thank you for attending and happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs>